Good morning, and welcome to Park Road Baptist Church. It is good to be worshiping together again. Um, we are back to not being able to fully see your faces, and I miss that. I had looked forward to uh, us making forward movement, but we've taken a step back. I can tell that a lot of people have taken a step back because there are not quite as many people in the room today, so we're more spread out than ever. And we are just asking people to honor one another's level of comfort. Um, I noted in the newsletter this week that a friend of ours, a consultant for churches, had written about um, how to maneuver church in these new days. And um, one of the things he says is keep it simple. The second thing he says is communicate well. And the third thing he says is have multiple entry points into the life of the church so that everybody can find their place where they feel comfortable and safe. And so that's what we're trying to do here, trying to find multiple entryways. And so welcome to those that are joining us live stream that for whatever reason are not comfortable being here in person or not able to be here in person. Uh, we're glad that you can now worship with us on vacation. So enjoy. Uh, but it is good to be back together in any way that we can be. We had begun to make some plans uh, for not this coming Sunday, but next Sunday, August 29th, which is the first Sunday after CMS school starts, and we had begun to make some plans for having a big lunch and water games, and then we decided, you know what, I don't think we're quite ready for that yet. Our target audience often for that is um, children and families, and those are the people that are not back. The children are not vaccinated, and families are just not feeling ready for that. So we're not gonna restart children's Sunday school yet. We will continue to have a nursery uh, for our babies and infants and uh, toddlers, and our nursery workers will be masked and vaccinated. And so we will continue to do that, but not ready to start our children's stuff full bore yet. So um, as Bruce Holiday said in our staff meeting last week, does kickoff Sunday have to be in August? Can we kick off in October? And we realize, you know what, we can kick off whenever we want to kick off. So just come as you feel comfortable. I will tell you that on August 29th, which would be our kickoff Sunday, if you are comfortable coming to worship as a family, we invite you to come, be in the sanctuary, sit with your family group, mass. Uh, that is going to be a Sunday of blessings. And one of the blessings of that Sunday will be a blessing on teachers and children. We will do it from afar. We will not bring you forward and touch you, lay hands on you or anything like that. But we do uh, want to invite families to get back in the swing of things here at church. So that's our plan uh, moving forward. We will have our first Wednesday night. We'll do a box supper. We'll be masked unless we're eating. We'll plan a few things for the people that want to be here in person. And then our other Wednesday nights will be our online meet and greet. And we'll just see how this takes us week by week. So keep in touch. And we will change as we need to change and move forward when it's time. And we'll take a step back if that is needed. I hope that the careful attention of our COVID task force helps you to feel like um, we're all taking care of each other. Even if we don't agree on everything that the group decides, we hope that you can see that what we have tried to do for this over a year is to find safe ways uh, and comfortable ways for us to stay connected as church. Um, youth will resume its activities, and Joey and Liza have sent you a schedule of events, and um, there's nothing tonight, and I don't think next week, but that will kick back off on August 29th. So youth, make sure you check in with Joey and Liza about the plans coming up for you all. Um, if you noticed walking in, Half of the sidewalks look beautiful and resurfaced, and that means it's halfway done. And next Sunday, we have to do the next section over a weekend so that it doesn't interfere with our Child Development Center access, which means that we can't walk on it next Sunday. So what I mean by we is you, because we won't be here to, for the fiasco. So 
Leslie and Dan will put up signs of ways to get around the access. If more people need to park on the street over here or just walk down the sidewalk and come in this way, you will not be able to go from the chapel doors to the back parking lot on the sidewalk because they'll be too freshly beautiful. And then after that, the whole resurfacing will be done and look lovely. But because of that, we will not have a nursery next week because we don't have a room to put the babies in. So just bring them in here and let them cry through Dan's sermon <laughs> next week. And he won't even notice. He has so many grandchildren, he won't even hear those crying babies, okay? So everyone still feel comfortable to come, but just a heads up, you're gonna have to take a little detour to get to the sanctuary next week because of the finishing of the sidewalks. The last thing let me mention to you is after worship today, we do have backpack snacking and uh, we'll do it masked. It's in the community center. And Dan says he really thinks we can be done in an hour. So if you can make it without going to lunch first, the newsletter said I was going to provide lunch for families, and that got in there from an old article back when we thought we were going to be farther along than we are, but we're not doing food. So if you're counting on me for food, you're going to be hungry. And so go get you something and bring it to eat or wait a little bit longer and eat afterwards. But Dan really thought we would be able to finish up in about an hour for packing to get ready for the first uh, few weeks of school to begin to offer our backpack snacks for our children at Marie G. Davis. That was a lot of information. So take a deep breath and enter into this time as we worship God in spirit and in truth.
Would you please stand and join me in reading responsively our litany of worship? Praise the Lord. Praise God in the mighty firmament. Praise God with the lute and harp. Praise God with strings and pipe. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Praise Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we come into your presence this morning knowing what you desire of us, that we do justice and love kindness and walk humbly with you. We gather this morning to remind each other about that to remember that now is always the right time to do these things. So with joy in our hearts, let us pray as Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
My wife is much more devout than I am. She wakes up most mornings at five o'clock or maybe sometime between five and six o'clock and spends about an hour with God in prayer and reading scripture. And I confess that I am not as faithful in doing that, not even close as, as she is. And usually my routine in the morning, uh, my alarm goes off around seven and my phone is right next to my bed and I'll look at my phone and read the news headlines and maybe check my bank account or something like that. She'll hear me fumbling around with my phone and sometimes peek her head in the door and say, have you prayed yet today? It makes me feel a little guilty, I have to admit. So I'm not trying to make you feel guilty, but have you checked your bank account yet today? Or your 401k? We are in a culture where money matters a lot to most of us, and maybe too much. As we take a few moments to reflect in silence together, I'd like you just to think a little bit about how high a priority is money in your life? Let us keep silence together. And now I invite you to pray with me our prayer of confession. We live in a culture that is obsessed with money, making it, spending it, saving it. But the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. And it's difficult to be obsessed with something and not love it. May God forgive our obsessions, our misplaced loves, and give us the priority of Christ, who had no place to lay his head and gave his all for our sakes. Amen. And know that even at times when our priorities may be a bit misplaced, even then, you are loved and you are forgiven, so be at peace. Russ is actually preaching on this text today, but just for logistics, he asked me to read it, and we were discussing, because I have no idea what he's going to say in the sermon, we were discussing how to set up the text, and I was just reminded, I must have never heard a sermon from Ecclesiastes growing up as a child or a teenager, because the preacher from Ecclesiastes says nothing like what I grew up hearing in church. What I grew up hearing in church was things like, don't party too hard, and, or better yet, don't party at all, and life is serious business, and money is the root of all evil. Today's aphorism is, money cannot buy happiness, and one would think that Russ would agree with that, but apparently, as the sermon title indicates, he's going to tell us something different. And then you turn to this preacher in Ecclesiastes, and this is what he says. Feasts are made for laughter, 
Wine gladdens life, and money meets every need. That is just not how I heard it told when I was growing up. Feasts are made for laughter, wine gladdens life, and money meets every need. Well, you've heard the ancient story. We didn't really plan it this way, but it seems to me like Amy's gotten all the wonderful feel-good aphorisms this summer. She's gotten to talk to you about how she could have done the social justice thing, but you know, she's going to talk to you as a pastor, and I get to talk to you about money. So be it. Money can't buy happiness. Everybody knows that. It's a truth the Bible seems to affirm. Jesus said, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth. They just rot. Store up treasures in heaven. He said, you cannot serve God and money, so seek first the kingdom of God. He told the parable of that rich man who kept getting richer with his farm, and then in a move of great arrogance, he tore down all of his barns. He was going to uh, build bigger ones. And he died that night, losing it all. Jesus asked, so what does it profit someone to gain the whole world if you lose your soul? Jesus doesn't seem to care about the Dow Jones industrial average if we have lost our morality. And Jesus said it's impossible, impossible for rich people to get into heaven. Now, we ought not mince words about this. 
Despite the clever ways preachers have interpreted around the discomfort Jesus offers in that parable about the camel and the eye of the needle, the meaning is self-evident. It is easier for a literal camel to go through the literal eye of a literal needle than for a rich person to get into heaven. Wow, that's hard. Those are hard words. Money can't buy happiness, much less your way into heaven. The Bible does not have much good to say about money. Reading most of the Bible, we can learn that money can't buy happiness. It can buy stuff, but stuff doesn't last. It can buy popularity for the moment, but, money is, but when the money is gone, so are the friends. It can buy power, but the Bible wants us invested in love. Money can't buy happiness. Everyone knows that. But my maternal grandmother, whose laughter was as big as she was, knew there was a slightly deeper truth. She kept a a refrigerator magnet that said it well. Money can't buy happiness, but it can make misery a lot more enjoyable. And she'd just laugh and laugh and laugh. And once again, today, the old sage of Ecclesiastes is inviting us to think more deeply on this personal and important and central topic, as Dan has reminded us, central topic. The unconventional wisdom of the old preacher surprises us in a bit of biblical contradiction. Feasts are made for laughter, As Amy said, where's all the seriousness of the spiritual life? And wine gladdens the heart. Let me promise you, Russ Dean never heard that sitting in the pews of First Baptist Church in Clinton, South Carolina, when his daddy was standing right here. Wine gladdens the heart. Not so much, folks. Money meets every need. Money meets every need. I thought only God met every need. It seems to have worked for Amy all summer. So now that we're nearing the end of the series, let me try it out for myself. You know, I could not decide which way to go with this sermon. It could be a stewardship sermon on the use of our resources. It could be an exercise just in biblical exegesis, the role that money plays in Scripture. It could be bent toward pastoral care, a lesson in generosity. I could talk about all those things, but I don't think I'll go there today. I think this sermon is about social justice. Justice for a society. Now, of course, social justice always includes stewardship and exegesis and pastoral care, But at least one truth we can glean from this unconventional wisdom is straightforward. Money, in fact, can meet every need. Or in other words, there's hardly anything that can provide a basic level of happiness as much as a basic level of income. Money meets every need for everyone in a society thinking about this text. I had a really good time thinking about this text, and it made me miss a couple of my old friends. It made me miss my old friend, a supporter and an antagonist, a debate partner who bested me in virtually every conversation we had, but he tolerated me nonetheless. I miss Dr. Ken Godwin. Ken was an interesting soul. While his academic studies had made him Uh, intellectually agnostic about many spiritual affirmations, Ken was as devoted to church, to this church, as anyone. Ken believed in the way of Jesus, and he knew the importance of church as community, having been raised by this church and a single mother who was struggling to raise three children in the 1950s. Ken was a social scientist by training, a libertarian by conviction, And he was a deacon by practice. His views that were consistent, at least in Ken's own mind, 
seemed to me to swing from pole to pole, from left to right and across the spectrum. In terms of money, Ken Godwin sometimes sounded like a conservative and other times not so much. Ken believed nothing was more important to the well-being of a family than a basic income. He would tell you, and then he would quote five studies to back it up, that up to $75,000 in household income, nothing changes a family's life, nothing. Not even the higher education that he loved, not religion, not even God. Nothing, Ken would say, could change a child's future more than money. Now, beyond that level of income, he would insist that the value of money has diminishing returns. Again, citing the studies to defend his position, Ken would say that more money is not an incentive for people who already have security. If you want to make better employees, don't promise them more money. That's not the incentive they need. And he would say more money for rich people might even be a bad thing. So Ken sounded like a conservative when he talked about the importance of a growing economy. He sounded less like one when he insisted that the more you have, the more you ought to pay. A progressive taxation is the only way to run a thriving nation. And while today's conservatives would not have appreciated Ken's take on taxing the rich, he actually sounded a good bit like Jesus, who once noted to whom much has been given, much more will be required. Being an academic, Ken would love to have discussed Fred Clark's quotation that is printed in your bulletin today, those terms from mathematics and logic, necessity and sufficiency. In agreement with the blogger from the Pathios website, Ken often insisted that money is necessary for happiness. Without being able to provide for oneself and one's family, it's almost impossible to find happiness. But money is never sufficient for happiness. Ken knew that too. Plenty of rich folks are not happy at all. Some money can make you happy. It's necessary. But money is never a guarantee of happiness. It's not sufficient. Yeah, I miss Ken Godwin, who had a lot in common with the cynicism and the uncommon wisdom of Ecclesiastes. And I miss another old friend, another sparring partner who was even more loyal to church and for more years than Ken Godwin, just as liberal in his theology and even more conservative in his politics. I miss my friend Chet Helt. There was never, there's never been a church member with whom I could disagree more, but whose disagreements never, ever, ever, ever made me worry that our relationship would be injured, that he would threaten to walk away or withhold his support or his participation. Chet had been taught that this is the way we do church. We talk. Even when we disagree, we talk. And then we go on loving one another. I miss that. It's a rare gift that some in Chet's generation in this church gain from our particular expression of local church. In this conversation today, I can guarantee you that Chet Helt would have sent me an email cautioning me about all those liberals who want to practice social engineering. You know, taking money from the rich and giving it to the poor. We can't do that social engineering. I've heard this from Chet many times. I can hear him now. But I would remind Chet, as I did on multiple occasions before he died, that we're already practicing social engineering. We always have. Every government policy, any structure of taxation, all incentives and disincentives engineer our society in one direction or another. There is no decision about if social engineering or not, just what kind of engineering. Will it be top-down or middle-out or bottom-up? And as a Christian, I would remind Chet that our convictions and commitments are first and foremost in trying to understand a biblical theology and in following the way of Jesus, even in our politics. Over the last 40 years, across all administrations, 
the political left and the political right. We have followed a strategy of social engineering that has benefited the wealthy far more than it has benefited the poor. Now, don't take Russ's word from it. The data are conclusive. Just to give you one example, since 2009, the pay for corporate CEOs has increased on average by more than 52%, but those at the bottom are still struggling for a living wage. Our decisions and strategies, our social engineering, continues to widen the gap between the rich and the poor. And I need to take this personal moment to say that if you're home and getting ready to turn off your computer, or you're about to walk out of the sanctuary because you think this is partisan pandering, you need to listen to your pastor more carefully, please. I will remind you, as I have on many occasions, that I believe in partisan dialogue, that we need all the voices at the table, from conservative to liberal and across the span. You can be a blue Christian, a red Christian, a libertarian Christian, an independent Christian, but it is my job as one of your pastors to invite you to put your faith before your party, a biblical theology before any other loyalty. So do your politics any way you see fit. But for people of biblical faith, the last and the least, the lost, must be first, even in the decisions we make for policies and procedures and politics. Now, simply put, I do not find justification in biblical theology from Genesis to Revelation to support a top-down model of religion or politics or economics. I think it's not there. The biblical story, almost from the very beginning, asks us to think carefully about this. Just after the creation narrative in Genesis, we read the story where Cain kills his brother Abel out of a fit of jealousy. And when God comes looking for Abel, Cain asks the Lord, am I my brother's keeper? That defensive question is basically the topic of our scripture from there to the very end. And the answer is unequivocal. By all means, yes. Yes, we are our brothers and sisters' keepers. Years ago, in a lecture, I was taught that the Bible is mostly about economics. And as I have read, as I have read and studied and preached for three decades since that lecture, I have been persuaded that this odd affirmation is actually correct. In many ways that people do not recognize, Scripture is about being our brothers and sisters, keepers in personal and political practice. And from beginning to end, God displays an unceasing devotion to and a priority for the poor. It is one of Jesus' most famous parables and one that is easy to spiritualize or, demiss with, or dismiss with sentimental appeals to charity. On that day that God judges between the sheep and the goats, the dividing line will be what they did, what we did and did not do for the poor, those who are left out, the down and out. When those on the left hand ask, when was it that we saw you naked and we did not clothe you, or hungry and we did not feed you, or in prison and we did not visit you, Jesus answers them, when you have not done it to the least of these, you have not done it to me. Now, that's a wonderful sentiment. That'll preach, you know, as they say. But if you want to take Jesus really seriously, you have to figure out how to actually implement the care of the least of these. And in doing so, what you will find is that you quickly move from preaching to politics from ethics to economics, from ministry to money. How do we take care of the least of these? A pastor and author named Thomas Horrocks says, charity cannot fix what policy has created. Policy will have to fix what charity cannot. And the unconventional wisdom of Ecclesiastes cuts right to the chase. Money meets every need. 
So here's the good news for you today. I hope you can hear this. Money actually can buy happiness. So use your money to buy all the happiness you can find. As John Wesley, the founder of Methodist Christianity, said so well, earn all you can, save all you can, and give all you can so that your money can buy a lot of happiness for you and also be an investment in the welfare and the happiness of all of God's people. It's about social justice. Money actually can buy happiness. May it be so. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, today we pray for the last and the least and the lost, the down and out and the left out, the homeless, the helpless, the hungry, the downtrodden, we pray for those for whom their very hard-earned paycheck or paychecks do not provide a living wage for their family. We pray for those who are living in their cars and under bridges and in tent cities and for those for whom their, a hotel is their only home. We pray for those who don't have enough to make ends meet. We pray for those who don't have school supplies, much less new clothes. We pray for those who are in a debt that they will never be able to pay off because of outrageous medical bills. We pray for those who are without insurance and for whom the emergency room is their only doctor visit. In short, we pray for the poor. Gracious God, help us to be our sisters and brothers keepers. Amen.
I'm grateful for good music today. Everywhere I've been in the last few weeks, when I've had a chance to tell people that we have just hired Matthew Manwar, and people who are in the know go, wow, that was a good day's work for you. So Matthew, thank you for being with us and for leading our ensembles. And thank you today to Bennett Dean. Y'all have met Bennett before. Ron Vereen is the president and principal trumpet player for the Charlotte Pride Band. I've gotten a chance to know uh, Ron in playing in the Pride Band over the last few years. We had a concert last night, and we were able to get him to run by today to play with us. And so Ron and Bennett, thank you. Ensemble, thank you for singing. Matthew, thank you for playing. Thank you for good music today. Somehow I skipped over one of my things that I was praying about. Maybe it was um, unintentionally uh, important. One of the things in my prayer was praying for people on free and reduced lunches who depend on backpack snacks for weekend sustenance, which leads us right into backpack snacks. If you can stay for about an hour, keep your mask on, go to the community center, and we will pack backpack snacks. and. It's one of the ways that we put our prayers into action. Our prayers only become a reality when we set forth to work with God to make it so. So that's one small way we can do that today. The final word is not ours, but the Lord's. So hear this good word of benediction as we go. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you. May God be gracious to you. May God give you grace this day to love with all your heart. That you might do justice. To love with all your soul. That you might show mercy. To love with all your mind. That you might walk humbly with your God. As you go into the world this day, dear friends, love the Lord your God with all your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. Amen.